Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Perceptive Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we examine the art and science of games. I am Josh Placer, and we have another developer interview lined up for today. My guest is the CEO of Stoneblade Entertainment, and he is a longtime developer with a background in everything from a Match of the Gathering to tabletop, CCG, and more. So please welcome to the podcast, Justin Gary. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Excited to be here. Always love chatting about games. Me too. And as I always say to everyone watching, if you are also interested and love to chat about games and want to come on for a future cast, please reach out. I am always looking for guests. But it is great to have you on, Justin. And yeah, we were trying, we have time zone related shenanigans as always, but it's great to finally get things set up. So we got a lot to talk about for our cast. So to get things started with, for people who aren't familiar with you, could you talk a little bit about, oh, excuse me, could you talk a little bit about your background and what are you currently working on now? Yeah, so my origin story uh, in a few minutes here, uh, I started off as a, uh, I won the Magic the Gathering U.S. National Championship when I was 17 years old, becoming the youngest uh, champion at that time. Uh, I then traveled around the world playing Magic professionally. That's how I paid my way through college, winning a Pro Tour, Grand Prix, and eventually the World Team Championships. Uh, after that, for some reason, I decided going to law school was a good idea, uh, and uh <laughs> After a year of that, uh, I dropped out uh, and moved across the country from NYU Law out to San Diego, California to start making games uh, for Upper Deck Entertainment. I worked on the Marvel and DC versus trading card system, the World of Warcraft trading card game. I designed, I lead designed, and uh, was the brand manager for the World of Warcraft miniatures game. Uh, eventually quit that job, started my own company, Stoneblade Entertainment, which at the time was called Gary Games, uh, and launched our first game, Ascension, uh, the deck building game. We were one of the very first deck building games on the market. Uh, that game was a bit more of a runaway success than I anticipated. Uh, and uh, that kind of launched me on quite the journey. A uh, really cool moment that happened about a year after launching Ascension. I went to a PAX developer conference and that uh, where, you know, talked to other developers. I gave a talk. Uh, Richard Garfield was giving a talk also. And, you know, Richard Garfield's got created Magic the Gathering, the godfather of our whole <laughs> industry, you know. So, of course, if the master is going to speak, I'm going to listen. So I get in, I'm in the crowd of people taking notes right along with everybody else. And at the end, there's a Q&A period where uh, somebody asks, hey, what's your favorite game right now, Richard? And he says, <laughs> Ascension. I <laughs> literally jump up out of my seat like like a kid, in a, you know, just jumping up. Everybody laughs. <laughs> but it creates the opportunity for me to open the door and start talking to Richard. I met Richard during my days on the Magic Pro Tour, but, you know, not really, like didn't really remember me. But so we start talking. I've mentioned, hey, I'm the designer of Ascension. And we chat for like three hours. Nice. And it's clear from that moment that we had the very same vision for what we both want to do next uh, on our projects. And that game was Soulforge. And Soulforge uh, was a, we we did a uh, crowdfund for it. So we started working on this back in 2011. We did a crowdfund. We launched it as a the first native digital trading card game. So the cards actually level up and evolve as you play. You always have a five card hand, you lane based combat. So it's kind of this process of like deck building as well as TCGs. Um, we were very proud of that game, launched it, ran it for five years or so, eventually had to take it down. And that was one of the most painful things that had ever happened to me. Cause prior to that, I had only worked on tabletop games and the tabletop game, when I stopped making it, you still have it, right? It's still there. Uh, and so, but when you have a turn to take down the service for a digital game, well, nobody has it. Mm -hmm. Your collection's gone. Everything's gone. And so I spent the next several years thinking, okay, how could I bring Soulforge back? And then it was another one of Richard's creations um, called Keyforge, which again, no relation. Soulforge came around first, but Keyforge, where he created uh, algorithmically generated decks of cards, which are single decks of cards where everyone is one of a kind, which well, I'm sure we'll get into more details about collectible card games in general. But one of the challenges mm -hmm. of collectible card games is like, look, everybody just ends up consolidating around the same strategies. There's some super rare cards that everybody wants. It The spoiler list ruins everything. Like there's a ton of problems that have come from TCGs. And again, this is the TCG lover speaking. So, but you mm -hmm. want to try to solve those problems. I immediately called him up, started asking him a bunch of questions about Keyforge. I realized it wasn't quite the vision of what I wanted to see. I uh, was, I wanted some customization. I wanted some more deep algorithm. And then I realized, oh, this is the answer. And I will bring back Soulforge now as Soulforge Fusion, which is a hybrid deck game. So we have a physical algorithmically generated decks of cards where you actually can shuffle build by building any two different decks, put them together. There are more 
uh, individual cards that can be algorithmically generated than there were in the first 20 years of Magic in our first release. And there are more deck possibilities than there are atoms in the universe. And every single deck can be scanned into your online account to be played digitally. So you can have a one-to-one -one collection between your physical game and your digital game. So that, amongst many other exciting projects, is the biggest one that I'm involved in now. And getting to work with Richard over this last decade plus uh, has been a real honor. Uh, and so I'll uh, I'll pause there. There's plenty of other cool things <laughs> we could dig into too, including you know I love teaching game design. I wrote a book on game design and podcasts of the same name. And I love to have these kinds of conversations. So we have a lot of other fun projects. But I'll I'll pause there as kind of just a highlight reel. Mm -hmm. And definitely a really solid highlight <laughs> reel to be sure, Justin. And I would love to talk to Richard as well, because I, again, I was telling Richard before, I wrote one of my books on the CCG, TCG design. So being able to chat with him and figure out all the things I did wrong or talked wrong about with magic would be great. But yeah, a whole lot there to we can certainly uh, springboard off of as a discussion. So I guess uh, my first question for you, then, as you said, like you kind of got this whole thing start with doing a Magic the Gathering tournaments and kind of coming in from the competitive side to then go into game dev. And I want to ask you, like, this is something like for everyone watching this, like we've talked many times here about how everyone has very varied and diverse backgrounds. I've actually spoken to a lot of people who've gone like into like lawyer, uh, law or investment and then <laughs> got into game dev too. And what I want to ask you about, like going from competitive, like think about a game from like competitive and that angle to think about things from a like, game design angle. Has that kind of like shifted your thinking or like has it like changed like how you look at games going from like these very two, like they seem like they would be very like comparable uh, mindsets, but I think we've seen it be kind of like the opposite from a lot of cases. A hundred percent. They are totally different mindsets. They are totally there's some overlap, but they're totally different skill sets. And uh, this I'll, I'll tell you a story that kind of illustrates this. Right. So for me where you know to, to 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 zoom in a little bit more i kind of glossed over this law school section of my story right i both my parents were lawyers my step my stepdad's a lawyer like i was always supposed to be a lawyer so even though i had already made a living playing magic professionally i'd already made a name for myself that was never taken seriously as something i would do forever it was just like okay yeah, i paid my way through college had some fun and so i went to go to law school and i got an opportunity that summer after my first year of law school because of my you know, being well known as a pro player to come and do like a summer internship at Upper Deck to like test their game and like make sure it wasn't broken and that kind of thing. Right. And so I come out there and I'm supposed to be working on the design of these this game and and and, and helping to make it better. And I realize I have no idea how to mm -hmm. do that. Like I thought that creativity was something that like other people had, right? The ability to be creative, the ability that there's some like, there's just some people that are like super creative and they go into a cave and they come up with cool ideas and they bring out from the cave and everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. And of course that's not true at all. And so what I did <laughs> was I had to do a lot of research. I had to learn, I, I read books on creativity. I interviewed other designers. I, I really did and dug in because I'm, I think of myself as an analytical person by default, right? I, I can, as a, as a, one of my strengths as a player was to break down a system into its constituent parts, see where something was like off or degenerate, and then just exploit the hell out of that, right? That was my, that was my role as a player was I just want to find out where you messed up as a designer and I'm going to break it yeah. in my favor. Now, as a, as a designer, the the role is totally different, right? My my job is to create systems that generate experiences for my players, right? I want to create, and that's the real cash value of everything that I do, right? It's it's what is the experience, what are the emotions I can create, what are the stories I can create, what's that that what's that value that gets generated for why someone's going to spend their precious time to play one of my games instead of the million other things they could be doing with their time, and so they're mm -hmm. very very different. Now, being a good player helps with the like development part of the process because I can I can take I can put my 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 pro player hat on and say, okay, mm -hmm. if I were trying to break this game, what would I do? And then I can go back and say, okay, well, let's make sure that doesn't work, right? Or make sure that the most powerful strategies are at least the fun strategies, right? Mm -hmm. In the, and sometimes in CCGs, you have things like, you know, to use the magic references, right? Where like stasis is the best strategy, where it just stops everybody from getting resources, and no, or counter spells are all the best thing, where you just stop people from playing cards. That's not fun, right? But if playing giant dragons and having giant battles and running back and forth and throwing lightning bolts around is that that actually is pretty fun. So if that's the best strategy, it's not a bad thing. And so, you know, knowing how to balance a game in that sense, that my pro skills come to play, but that is a maybe 10% of the 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 job of a of a game designer and, and really understanding how my 
decisions when it comes to the, the rules and the components and the interactions that players will have impacts the emotional experiences for players and the excitement and the stories that they're going to tell after the fact. That's the real job of design. And I had to learn that from the ground up. And it was not easy, uh, but yep. I'm very proud to have uh, built those skill sets and met and learn from the best in the world, like Richard, uh, to really be better at that. And, you know, having done it now for 20 years, I've, I've, I've gotten okay at it. Yeah, and it really echoes a lot of the stuff that I found. Like when I, I, again, I've been playing video games for over 30 years now, but I didn't really start to study them until maybe 2012, 2013, when I started doing game wisdom, talking to a lot of developers, and just kind of understanding that there's more to a video game than just being able to figure out, haha, fireball hits enemy, that looks cool. There's a lot that goes into this, and there's a lot that goes into kind of getting the aesthetics and kind of the thought process you want for the player. And one of the things that we've seen, I'm curious what your thoughts on this, is that over the last like 10 years, we've seen a lot, or we've seen at least in the indie space, like competitive players, esports teams, people like that collaborating with games or trying to make like their ideal version of a fighting game or a deck builder or a MOBA or whatever. And a lot of these games just end up, they come out, and then they're gone within maybe two to three months. Like, there's just nothing that kind of, like, sticks out. And it's always that kind of, I think, pro or it's like this trap I see a lot of people fall into where, yes, it's great to design a game for the super elite, you know, top 2% of your player base. But then what about the 90% of everyone else who isn't interested in playing this game at the pro level or it has no idea what would be like a pro strat or how to build a deck or the ultimate best combos for a fighting game? And I think it is a very it's a very important skill set, but it's also a very hard skill set to try and learn. Yeah, yeah. Like your player base, you, know, you could think of it like a pyramid, right? And that mm -hmm. that two percent top tier player, that's only that little itty bitty bit of the pyramid. And there's value to having the top of the pyramid that people can aspire to and having your game hold up. Like you don't want it to just crack at the top, right? But yeah. if you're not catering to the base, then the whole thing is going to topple over because you're putting way too much weight at the top of the pyramid and not enough weight on the base of the pyramid, right? You need to have mm -hmm. the vast majority of your players are never going to play in a tournament. They're never going to be at super competitive levels. They just want to be able to have a good time and experience the game. And there's actually really interesting things. I had a great chat uh, about this with Richard on uh, on the podcast when he was on my podcast um, of where, you know, when you're trying to balance games, you actually need to be thinking about it in terms of the different brackets that you're going to be competing in. Because it might be the case that, mm -hmm. let's say, counter spells really aren't very good at the top tier levels, right? It's just an example of like a strategy that may be not fun. But when you're playing at the casual levels, players don't know how to play around it correctly. And so it actually is dominant. And so for bad players, this game is, is broken, even though if they were better, it wouldn't be broken. That's still a problem for your game, right? And so making sure mm -hmm. that the play experience is fun and that there's a steady discovery curve as people play that as they're you know video games generally speaking have an easier time with this right because they can give you levels they can gate you much more yep. clearly they can push you through and teach you things step by step right whereas with a with a tabletop game you don't really have that luxury in the same way right people are getting thrown out into the wilds in a lot of a sense and have to yep. discover something to go but there's still a lot of tools and so you'll purposely build in these little hooks and things that people will say oh wow this is this i think this is too good and that's often a good thing that they think oh wow I, look how i've look what i've done i've i've cheated the system or i've beaten the game or i've done this cool thing and then mm -hmm. they realize oh wow there's this whole other level to it oh wow there's a whole other level to it. and creating a system that can smoothly bring people along that discovery curve is one of the skills of design yep i mean the same thing i can i've just finished writing my book on rts design and it's the same thing with kind of like the unit design factor design in that respect where it's this idea of yes it sounds so cool it's broken it's overpowered until you learn, hey, maybe this thing just dies to air. Or maybe by just uh, stun lock it, it just dies immediately. And then now it's suddenly not overpowered. And your point about kind of like understanding like the different brackets and tiers of your player base is also important. Because again, like you'll have strategy. And I've seen this with a few of the deck builders I play. For a brief time, I played Gwen. This was like the uh, second iteration of it. And they had, I think, a very smart decision to kind of separate their ladders into both the kind of pro division and then just the casual division. And playing at the pro level is obviously very different than playing at the casual level. And it's good to have that because, as you said, like the casual player base is never going to get to the pro level and the pro player play base never wants to play with the casual level. 
So you have to kind of think about your game in these different mindsets. And it also means trying to understand when something is too good, if it's not good enough. And I guess that's another question for you as well, especially doing so much with tabletops and CCG, TCG. Balance is a nightmare, no matter what genre we're talking about, let alone one that, again, like if you put out a bad card, you can't patch a physical card. It's going to stay until you decide to ban that card or at least another edition. So a lot has to be done before that to make sure that something is good. So I'm going to, this could probably be like its own podcast right here. This next question, like how, like what is your mindset when it comes to balancing something in a game like this? Yeah. So yes, you're right. Uh, there's a lot to be said here. Uh, and uh I think the what I'll do is I'll give a few key principles here, right? And I write I write a whole I, I wrote a whole article about this called the Balance and Balance, which you can find on uh, my Substack, and there's an entire section of it in my book. But I'll give some principles here that are highlights, right? Um, when you're thinking about balance for a game, you're not thinking, you know, a lot of people think that means everything needs to be equal, and that's just not true, right? Mm -hmm. That's actually a nightmare because yeah. that's really boring, right? You want there to be some strategies that are better than others because, as I mentioned, you're trying to create this like curve of growth and learning as you go you want to discover that there's a reason why we intentionally do put bad cards into ccgs because people don't know that they're bad cards until they understand the game a little better and they're like oh wow okay i don't want to use that i now can play replace it with this better card and we want to put in cards that seem like they're too good that you get excited about and then you learn different things right or cards that seem that they're bad and then you realize they're really good right that that discovery is part of the excitement but let's say there's three kind of top tier principles that i think uh, are important for balance that regardless of what type of game you're making, right? One is um, really rock, paper, scissors has it best. Um, you typically don't want a uh, one single, the, the key to a balance is not everything's equal, but that there's no one single strategy that's always dominant in each case. And so rock, paper, scissors is a great example because I don't care how strong you think rock is, if I know you're <laughs> going to throw rock, I guarantee you I can beat you, right? <laughs> so so that's a, a simplified version, obviously, but you want to make it such that any one strategy, there is a counter strategy to it, right? And that creates a good circle, a kind of good meta game that evolves as people start assuming other people are going to adopt certain strategies and adopting their strategies accordingly. So that's like a kind of a good metric of like, are we in a good place? If I know for sure what you're going to do, can I adopt a strategy that will beat you? If the answer is no, then there's a problem. If the answer is yes, then okay, there's probably a decent game going on here. Second, there is a, um, a real... Uh, understanding that with any complex game system where you're going to have millions of players or you know lots of there they are going to be smarter than you you cannot get everything right um and so you know i have a very talented team we spend a lot of time many, you know months and months for each set we do development lots of effort lots of man hours but that's pales in comparison to the millions of hours that get spent playing the game so knowing you're going to get it wrong sometimes you want to err on the side of make the fun things the broken things right if you have to make love when in doubt <laughs> as i mentioned this earlier right like if it's going to be giant dragons that are winning the battle versus like freezing all the resources and not letting your opponent play cards for the love of god push the power level into the dragons right give people more fun mm -hmm. so what you think is going to be the heart of your game and this comes down to the, the most fundamental aspect of game design i've already mentioned right player experience is the only metric that matters you need to understand what the core emotion you're trying to get with your game what the core tension of, is of your game and use that always as your lodestone for when you're making decisions so when in doubt push the fun is kind of this other principle um mm -hmm. and then the last one is kind of a little bit of a safety valve if you will uh which is uh you know include silver bullets um and what this means is like in you know you just wrote a book on rts's right so you know some narrow units that if i know my opponent is going to be doing a certain type of strategy again like this will crush your strategy or in tcg cards that like you know destroys all the red cards in play right or it can do something that would be totally useless in certain circumstances but if yep. the things get too out of hand there's a few tools in the toolbox that your players can pull in pull on to be able to help correct the problem so if you miss by too much there's some tools that come to correct it right silver bullets are a terrible weapon to use in most combat silver is a terrible metal you don't want to shoot anything with a silver bullet but <laughs> if you've got a werewolf problem boy oh boy are you glad to have that so I think those are a few principles. Again, there's a million things we could pack and yep. unpack here. Uh, and I, I've written extensively about it, but those are at least a few useful tools that no matter what kind of game you're working on, those principles should apply.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you, you almost like I think echoed my thoughts exactly when I wrote about in my CCG book about having like you want everything to have like it's like moment in the sun, but at the same time, if I know the player is going bats, they have a bat strategy, I know it, I see it coming, and I build the anti bat strategy and it fails. I'm going to hate that game, and we've seen this. Uh, we've seen this time and time again in a lot of CCGs and a lot of RTS games. Like any game where you have like again like this level of complexity in terms of builds and strategies, and it is very hard for a lot of people. And like to go back to what we were saying earlier about like the whole idea that there was that kind of mythos at a time where everyone thought, okay, if it, you can win fifty percent of the time, or it's always fifty fifty, then that must be perfectly balanced. But it really doesn't work out that way. And again, if players will know, and I'm sure this is something you can definitely attest to both as a designer and as a former competitive player, that people, if they know that there is a broken strategy, they will use that strategy every single time at the expense of everything else. Because if they know that this works 90, 95% of the time and there's no easy counter, why the heck would I build anything else? And it's why for a lot of competitive games, there's always that meta chase. And I guess that's another question for you. Like with like what you've been doing and with your background, like what are your thoughts on trying to like break or keep the meta from solidifying? Yeah, well, I mean, it's still the same. It's just another lens on the same problem we've mm -hmm. talked about, right? Like I don't, I don't want there to be one dominant strategy that can't be countered and thus things become stale and boring, right? So that's, that's what you're trying to avoid. So the goal is that that's never the case, mm -hmm. or if it is the case and you have an ongoing content release strategy, then hopefully it's only the case for a very short time or the, the window between when players discover that mm -hmm. whatever that equilibrium is, or that dominant strategy is, there's new stuff coming to change that. Um, you know, uh, again, the target being that you're never in that situation. Um, and it's the same, it's the same principle. Again, this is not a TCG unique to TCG thing. This is every, any game is going to have competitive people playing it. And, and, you know, different categories of game require different levels of focus and effort and certain games are self-correcting and other ones, you know, have different things. So like I have another game, uh, or this one here, I have the, you gotta be kidding me. This is a <laughs> game we just released nationwide in target. And it's a cute family bluffing card game. And there's not, you know, you're constantly just trying to guess. It's kind of like a cross between uh, Liar's Dice and Uno with adorable pets on it, right? A game like that does not require the same level of like meta game analysis, right? Because it's just people like lying and bluffing to each other. And so the group will self dynamically correct for it, right? Or, you know, a lot of social games like, you know, code names or, you know, uh, Cards Against Humanity or any of those kinds of things where it's like the, the social dynamics of the group, the norms of the group can determine what the quote unquote meta game is, right? There are certain types of answers or certain types of bits, bids. Uh, people are more likely to bluff and people are more likely to make certain kinds of associations. And you learn about the people around you and you will self-correct within your own community. And that's true <laughs> even when it comes to, you know, TCGs and things in the casual level. They'll be like, you know, I don't know if you guys had this, you ever had this experience where you're like, all right, you know what? You can't play with that card anymore. Like that card is banned at our table, right? And they'll custom create their own experiences. And that's great, right? People customizing and building their own uh, their own games, having systems where people are, you know, you you can create hooks that uh, people care less, right? There's a there was a game out there called We Didn't Play Just This at All, uh, which I thought was a hilarious name for a game, and it was like we're setting you up for a world where like, of course things are broken, of course it's going to be unfair. Or I have a great uh, a game I made uh, called Ringmaster. It's a uh, it's a circus themed game, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of like a cross between there was a game called Flux. And uh, just like type one magic, like the most powerful card you could imagine from from the, the old TCG days. But you just draw it and play it. And, and they're totally unfair and it's totally unbalanced. And that's fine because it sets you up up front. And if you get the broken cards and win, the game is fast enough. The cost of losing is low and you just shuffle up and play again. If each game takes 10 minutes and you know you're going to have as much chance to get a broken strategy next time, you hope to get the more broken strategy and that's okay. Whereas if a game like Soul Forge Fusion, where we're saying, look, hey, there are tournaments, there's real prizes on the line. We're expecting, you know, people are investing a lot of time and energy and money into their collections. That one, you need to take a lot more seriously and invest a lot more in making sure that there's a balanced meta game, that the cards all, you know, that there's good mm -hmm. synergies and strategies and people can work for it. So, so it really does depend upon your audience and how you set up the expectations for your audience also determines what type of balance, quote unquote, or metagame you want to be building. Mm -hmm. And to kind of build off of that, another question I wanted to ask you about with regards to the concept of rarity. 
this is something that is oftentimes like kind of unique to deck builders. We even see this in like the mobile gotcha space, that kind of domain where it's not just about building cards. It's about this idea of, okay, we have the normal card, the magic card, the rare, legendary, epic, whatever kind of qualifiers you want to put in there. And suddenly you have this kind of intersection between the monetization of your game and the design of your game. Because one of the things that we've seen is that in order to incentivize spending money, you make your higher quality cards, obviously, really damn good. But conversely, that also means if you don't have a lot of money, if you're not able to get those cards, you're going to be in for a rough time. And as a developer, it's also that balance of, do I make this card so damn good that everyone's going to want to buy it? But then if people don't buy or they don't get it, then they feel horrible or they feel the game is broken and blah, blah, blah. So, like, from your own perspective, how do you balance, I guess, again, like, this idea of I want to incentivize you to get these cards, but at the same time, I can't exactly say get this card and you will now be the one of the top 10 players in the world because the card's so good. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, this is the kind of pay to win uh, challenge, right? You don't want a game to fall into this category where the people who spend the most money are the ones who win all the time. And there's some games that just lean into this stuff, right? A lot mm -hmm. of these mobile free to play games are just like, okay, they're gotcha games. They're 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 there to exploit. You spend more money, you're more powerful. I personally detest those kinds of games. It's not my it's not my jam. Um, but how you can do this? So there's a couple different principles I use, right? Uh, number one. I need to, I want it always to be the case that anyone who's spending money on one of my games is feeling like they're getting such an incredible deal and they've got so much entertainment and joy out of it that they're happy to spend that money, right? I don't want somebody to be spending because they feel like they have to chase an experience that they can't get and they have to keep buying to do to get that experience. I want it because I've had so much fun and I've enjoyed this game, I want to be able to buy more. And if I were the customer, if I were the player, how would I feel in that situation, right? That's like the metric I try to use at a top line. I also think that you really need to think about your game and your business model at the same time. Like you need to build the mm -hmm. design of the game and the business model together. If your game is a subscription model, what does that mean? How often do you want people playing every day? How often do you want them logging in? How often, you know, what, what makes that fun month over month? And a lot of that comes down to like building relationships and having live operations and events and things that are changing all the time as you're playing. If you're building a game with a repeat purchase model, like a TCG or, you know, any kind of random loot, loot box type of thing, then you want there to be reasons to get excited about what you could open. And the worst thing you could do to a player is have every card in a pack always be the same every time and nothing exciting ever happens, right? That's like terrible model. The, the excitement of opening up a pack and thinking I might get something really cool or really, really rare is fun. Now, you, when you framed this, you said, well, do I have to make these cards really powerful in order to make people want them? And I would tweak that a little bit and say, I do have to, I don't have to make it really powerful, but I have to make it desirable. Right. Mm -hmm. And desirable can mean a lot of things, right? It can mean that it's got a foil treatment on it. It can mean that it's mm -hmm. it's a really cool, really unique strategy that you can't employ otherwise unless you have a couple of these cards. Doesn't mean it's the best strategy, but it's a really cool, unique strategy other people couldn't have, right? Or it could be just some variations on other things that are available. And so you do want some powerful cards that are obviously powerful people to chase after, but you also want cards that are obviously powerful that are available that people can play with at, at, at the lower tier so they can experience the game and have fun. And so ideally you want to unlock more variety of strategy and more variety of ways players can um, express themselves in terms of cosmetics, in terms of different, you know, unique ways to play, uh, but not necessarily just like pure power level. And this is one of the problems that we were trying to address with Soulforge Fusion. I mean, like, again, every TCG as, you know, whatever job level you want to do with it, at some point, the game coalesces around this small percentage of the total card pool are the ones that are actually good. These small percentage of total strategies, often just one mm -hmm. to three deck strategies total, are the only ones you can realistically play if you want to win. And then everybody just coalesces around that and gets boring until you get new content. Yep. Soul Forge Fusion was built with the principle in mind that that's not possible because every single deck you open is one of a kind. There's no one degenerate strategy to go copy. Now, there may be some unique cards that you're like, okay, these cards are really good and I really want to get this combo. I really want to combine these two decks together, but you have to adapt to the strategy that you have. And you have to, and we built an algorithm that keeps decks within a power band to make sure that you're never going to get a deck that has like anti-synergies, right? You're never going to get a deck that has a zombie Lord, but no zombies in it. 
And you're never going to get a deck that's like so far outlier on the other side. But we do have a good band within that of cool things you can get. And you can still envision and dream of the perfect half deck to pair with the deck you have. So you can shuffle those together and, and, and you know, have these cool, quote unquote, broken strategies. But we have built it such that there's a great band for people to play in. There's no net decking. There's no common thing. And anybody can open up a single box and have a good experience because they just shuffle the two decks together and play and they're going to have a good time. And so that's something mm -hmm. we built you know, very intentionally with, again, the technology that didn't exist 10 years ago, right? Algorithmically generating decks, printing, digital printing, and having the ability to scan those decks in and have a one-to-one -one collection to your online account. You know, it's, these are the kinds of things that get me excited as a designer, because even though I've been doing this for 20 years, you know, mm -hmm. being able to leverage universal principles of design, right? These the, the principles don't change of what makes games good, but the technology allows for new ways to solve old problems and new opportunities to explore design space that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, like that is a really good point about like uniqueness. Like you want to sell the player on this is a really cool strategy and you need this car, but it's not the strategy. And again, that is always the problem with just any kind of game build along these lines. And to, to kind of like go back or to build off what you're talking about regarding the power curve. That's another thing that I want to ask you about kind of deck building and tabletop design. Another challenge of any kind of competitive game is how do you keep adding in new content? And this can be anything from a deck builder to a MOBA to just pick any kind of game where the idea is that you're introducing new stuff. And part of the problem with introducing new stuff is that new stuff is generally going to be better than the old stuff. Sometimes it's very explicit. If, you know, your old strongest car had seven attack, and you now release a new car that's 10 attack, well, that new car just set a new standard. But then there's the idea of it being more implicit that, okay, a car that you release one year, let's say the biggest thing it does is it does two more damage, you know, when you have water on the field. And one of the things that we see even just in, not only in the tabletop and in mobile design, but even in the gotcha design, is that they start adding more and more like over the top abilities. Like it becomes more complicated. So now a new card release can have like, you know, a small paragraph of effects and bonuses and all kinds of additional rules to it. And it does, again, as we said, like there's that balance between making things worthy of being chased after, but not so much forcing the player that, hey, you didn't, you know, open up the latest booster day one, week one you're now completely behind, you're screwed. So how do you kind of balance or what are your thoughts to like, again, introducing new concepts, new power, but still keeping your game within some kind of a spectrum of balance? Yeah, so this is obviously a tough problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the there's there's this is kind of the concept of power creep uh, mm -hmm. is, is the terminology that we typically use for yep. it. This idea that things get like slowly more and more and more and more and more powerful over time because look, as a, as a designer, as a publisher, you need people to buy the new thing, right? Because that's the thing mm -hmm. you're actually selling. If people don't buy the new thing, the game goes out of business and you don't get to make any more of it and they don't get to play any more of it. Um, so you need the new thing to be desirable. Now, does it need to be strictly more powerful than what came before? And the answer is no, but it does mm -hmm. need to be at least on par with it. And so uh, your the, ch the challenge being to try to keep that, you know, one... I try to avoid the the what we call strictly betters, right? The idea that this same creature had seven power before and it's got 10 power now. That I think generally speaking feels bad because as a player, the card I had that I really cherished that was seven power is now garbage, right? It's just literally you know useless. Whereas uh, hopefully I can create something that's like, oh, okay, well, this guy has 10 power, but he's weak in this other way that didn't exist before. And so like, okay, well, maybe I want this new card because I want the more power, but uh, maybe somebody's going to take advantage of that new drawback where he gets destroyed if there's two adjacent creatures to him or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, the again, the tool that I will try to use. Or very often what's what's really nice is to be able to just, each new content release, we try to build in some new major mechanics, some new play patterns, something that, like again, feels fun, right? Again, trying to push the fun and saying that, and then you can build variations of the old cards that play with the new mechanic. So for example, um, in Soulforge Fusion, the first set, there was only creatures and spells, right? Creatures would stay into lanes, there's five lanes of combat, spells would just do an effect and go away. All the cards leveled up when you played them. So they would go into your discard pile, every three turns you shuffle your deck, get access to your new cards. In set two, we introduced exalts. 
And exalts are kind of like, uh, they're cards that modify a lane. So in addition to one creature per lane, you could also have one exalt per lane. And those would like, kind of like, a, would mod, you know, could, could change the creatures, could change what happens when you successfully attack. And so that was like a cool new play pattern that changed the game and added more permanency to the game. Uh, so it's fun and a reason to go get it on its own. And then we could just create cards that would be like, hey, instead of a seven power creature, this one's a six power creature, but if it's in a lane with an exalt, it's a nine power creature, right? And so now all of a sudden it's like, okay, I've given you a reason to play with the new mechanic. The new mechanic gives you a new play pattern, different ways to think about your cards. And I can make cards that are quote unquote more powerful in the right context, which is encouraging you to play with the new fun thing but also opens itself up to weaknesses. If I can destroy your exalt, or if you're in the wrong, you know, you don't have an exalt and that creature's not as good in this situation. And so it's created contextual power. It's mm -hmm. created fun play patterns and it differentiates itself from what came before. And that drives people to try out the new thing and play the new thing and have fun with it, right? Or if you're talking about an RPG or a, um, you know, I've gotten hooked on uh, the Diablo Immortal recently, right? And so they've introduced a new character class and it's like, okay, cool. Like there's new play pattern, there's new types of things I could do that I couldn't do before. Is it more powerful than the other classes? Yeah, maybe, maybe not, but it's something that's different. And because I like this game and now I want to try the new pattern, I'm going to go and check that out. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as a developer, you want to make sure that the new thing is not just like worse than the old thing. Um, but ideally you're keeping it <laughs> in that place where it's par, it's very close and the newness gets you there. Or also that you do things to the metagame that make it, gift over time so like maybe there's a new card that really crushes an old strategy and the old strategy was dominant before but because the new set's releasing a card that makes that old strategy not so good now it creates space for new strategies to evolve not just from the new release but even from the old release maybe there's some cards from the old set that previously just were being suppressed by the dominant strategy at the time that now because you've created a new tool that wipes out the dominant strategy everybody else gets to crawl out from under their rock where they were hiding and now it creates a whole new metagame Mm -hmm. yeah and just being able to again like keep things within that kind of spectrum and again like it's always about introducing that next cool thing and the next cool thing doesn't have to be the next overpowered thing and like uh, as you're describing kind of like the uh different like seasons of like your content it reminds me a lot of when i was looking at that uh, marvel snap game that like really blew up i think it was about a year or so ago and there is again that kind of there's a really good like thing topic there about kind of segmenting out your content in this respect. That again, like year one or season one content is your basic. Season two starts adding new stuff. Season three and so on. It also, in a way, I think, kind of provides almost like a soft like account level for these kinds of games, saying that okay, if you start playing my game, you will only be able to use season one cards. That's it. These are all the cards you're going to get. These are all the units you have access to. You've learned how to do this. You play enough. Now you get season two. And now we add more complexity, more variety. And I think it does a far better job compared to saying, okay, you just started playing this game. Here, go against someone who's been collecting for the last five years. They're going to throw 10 legendaries at you turn one. Roll with that. Yeah, yeah, that's there's yeah, there's a lot of things that unpack there. So like one, obviously, may, being able to segment your player base, right? So the new mm -hmm. players play in the kiddie pool for a while before they get thrown in with the sharks, and that's you know dependent upon having a large enough player base. Or you want to create these safe spaces. So another thing we did with Soulforge Fusion is in addition to the classic kind of CCG model where I can battle against other players online, or I can battle against you know randomly, or battle against a friend, or in tournaments. We also created an algorithmically generated PVE campaign. So mm -hmm. similar to games like Slay the Spire, you can, but but because unlike in games like Slay the Spire, you can actually take your custom deck into this algorithmically generated campaign, battle against bosses, gain XP, level up your deck, get unique powers, swap out your cards, all kinds of fun stuff. And that creates a space where you can actually practice and play with your decks and learn. And that's actually the first thing we force you to do before we let you get into the PvP world. We want you to play with your deck in this space. We've created mm -hmm. customized challenges for you. It's an opportunity for you to learn. It's an opportunity for you to earn new decks and unlock some cool freebies. And then over time, now we're going to let you go out into the into the big scary world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we have matchmaking, of course, to help balance the matchups and everything as well. But but you, it's another one of those areas where you really want to tailor the player experience 
give them the option to play the kind of game they want to play. We have a bunch of players who never play against opponents online. They just have so much fun playing the campaign mode and that's what mm-hmm. they're excited about and vice versa. Some people just want to play PvP. They're not interested in campaign mode. And some yep. people, you know, they want to do both. So being able to let people opt into the type of experience they want in the same way that I might sit around the kitchen table and play with my friends, but I'm not going to play with the person who always plays the counterspell deck every time they're mm-hmm. banned from my house, right? I can still do that. We want to give people the opportunity to opt into the types of experiences that they want. Yeah, and that really echoes what I was just writing about in my RTS book and how kind of like one of the reasons why the RTS genre kind of like fell by the wayside for a lot of people was that they, a lot of the goal was just focused entirely on the competitive eSport, you know, high-level play, and they kind of neglected like the single-player campaign, the wacky missions, and a lot of the consumer base, as you said, like there are people who will either do all single-player, they'll do all multiplayer, and you may have some people who will do like a little bit of both, but if you kind of cut part of your entire market out, you're not going to have anyone else to play that game with. And as we said like earlier, like if you only care to that 2% super hardcore minority, that's not how you're going to really be able to build or sustain a game for months, if not years of new content. Because, yes, you put out new stuff, but if only 2% of the people are buying it, how are you making a living? How are you continuing to grow all of the same 2% of that uh, player base for five, 10 years? Yeah, that's right. And I think, it, as you mentioned earlier, right, it's a common mistake that's made by the people who are at the top and they are mm-hmm. in living in the competitive world. And again, I made these same mistakes, by the way, when I first started mm-hmm. designing games. Like, I don't want to pretend like I was immune, right? I came in as a pro player. I started learning about the, you know, how to do good design, but I still was a pro player bias. And so I made a game that was very... uh let's call it advanced uh, and mm-hmm. the sense that like understanding the nuances of it and balancing it for there. And, you know, it wasn't the right thing for the audience that the game, I was making a superhero card game and, and, you know, my, my lead design set was the DC infinite crisis set and I'm proud of it, but it was, I look back and man, there are some clunky things or stuff that was clearly <laughs> just like me trying to be too clever and play to the pros instead of just saying, Hey, listen, man, this is a superhero card game. You want to go smash with Superman and battle against Batman <laughs> and, you know, have the fun of that experience. Mm-hmm. And that's really the heart of it. And the rest of it's got to serve that. So, you know, I think we all learn those lessons some sooner than later. I think it's a real challenge where a lot of people, you know, I think like um, game design is a lot like uh, like writing books. I think uh, people, everybody thinks that they can do it uh, <laughs> because they've read a book or they've played a game, right? People don't have this problem when it comes to like movies or architecture, right? They're like these things, they realize that like it takes a team, it takes a lot of experience, it takes a lot of resources to make it right. Uh, but games at, and books are the same <laughs> thing. They're very hard to do. You've written books, you've seen, you've looked in, you know, in the, you've studied mm-hmm. games. It takes, it takes a lot of effort. And it's, I think, uh, it's a craft. And it's a craft I've spent, you know, 20 years working on, and I still have tons to learn. That's why I like having conversations like these, you know, mm-hmm. both on, you know, other people's podcasts, on mine. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's something that there's always more to unlock and understanding the different player profiles that you want to appeal to, understanding all the nuances of how little shifts in what you do can change how people react to it. I'll give you one example that's a really fun one. Um, you know, in terms of loss aversion and how players think about this sort of thing. So there was a, in World of Warcraft in the early beta stages, because I was part of the early beta because I was working on the brand mm-hmm. for the tabletop versions. Uh, they had a system where uh, whenever you had played the game for a while, there was a exhaustion penalty mm-hmm. and you got half experience points. And people were up in arms. They were like, this is so wrong. You're trying to squeeze more dollars out of us to make us play longer. This is horrible. You're the devil. They're like, okay, okay, we hear you, we hear you. And instead, now they have a system where if you haven't logged on for a while, you actually get a rest (laughs) bonus of 200% experience. Same mechanic, same system, 100% mechanically identical, except now they frame it as a bonus first rather than a penalty later. And now it's like, oh my God, this is the best. You guys are awesome. Mm -hmm. This is such an incredible system. It really rewards us when we come back. And now the entire player experience has changed just because of the way you framed the mechanism. So even for those of us who start with an analytical mind and be like, okay, well, all I care about is the math behind the problem, right? It's not, that's, that's, that's a one piece of the puzzle. And so there's so many little nuances and that's just a random example of something I think is a fun, a fun one um, that we learn as we, as we design and as we kind of perfect the craft. 
Mm -hmm. And that's what I know very well. And it is just a fun way. Uh, it's kind of why a lot of we talk about like high level game design is almost like psychology. It's about trying to get the player to that specific mindset. I mean, as a really good example, we do not have the time to get into this right now. Like the uh, new Elden Ring DLC was released and you have all the hardcore players hating it, all the people who are casual loving it because there's more ways of playing it. And Again, it is a very complicated task, and it's very tricky to do that right. And about like loss aversion, like that is also one of the key points for a lot of churn for competitive games. You show a new player, say, hey, this game you're going to play, you're going to get your butt kicked into the ground for the next 50 to 100 matches until you learn it. Do you want to play this game? A lot of people go, no. I won't play a game where every five minutes I get to see you lose in blazing at the top of the screen. And it's why for a lot of these games, there is some massive churn that happens. Because, again, people and there's a greater discussion we had about this. It's hard to get someone to appreciate or understand that it's good to lose. Like you shouldn't feel like one loss is the end of the world for you. Yeah, that's right. I think that the. One of the things I'm trying to do constantly is make people feel like they're winning all the time, even when they're not. Mm -hmm. um, right? You want people to feel like they're making progress and feel like they're 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 succeeding. So you mentioned Marvel Snap. Um, they actually, uh, you know, Ben Brode, who was the creator of that game, was on my podcast as well, and we've been friends for a long time. Back when he used to work in his Blizzard days, you know, and they they put they first of all when they lost the game, they actually paid like 200 people to just play in the queues and lose like just to be out there and so that people could feel like they were winning. So they had like opponents ready to go at any time. And then eventually they replaced those with bots. So you have bots that can do this for you. And like, <laughs> you know, as AI gets better and bots can be, cause you really want that. You want that edge where you're like winning, you know, in the online competitive play, you really want to be winning like in that 70, 80% range, right? That time where you're like, you're winning most of the time, but you lose often enough that you, you still feel challenged and you feel like you're learning and growing. If you win hundred percent of the time, it gets boring. If you lose hundred percent of the time, you're for sure quitting, right? And even 50, 50 is not a yeah. good rate. Actually, people feel bad about that. So you want to be able to put a situation where people can win as often as possible. But even beyond that, let's say you don't have that kind of tool, right? So my game Ascension, for example, right? It's a deck building game. You're competing over the resources of trying to gain uh, XP, uh, gaining honor from killing monsters in the center row. Um, only one person is going to win that game. It's a tabletop game. I can't put an AI in place. I can't pay somebody to play against you, right? Um, uh, there is a digital version for anybody that wants to play that, of course. But um, what the game is built so that you're not really directly attacking players. And you, in a deck building game, you start with a very basic deck of cards. And as you play the game, your strategy gets better, your deck gets better, you feel a sense of progress and that you're making, you know, you're doing a lot of cool things. And so even when you lose a game of Ascension, you still feel this sense of like, oh, wow, I look at this cool thing and I had a couple really cool turns and I did this thing. And if only I had one more turn or two more turns, I could have done this and this and this and this, right? And the game is purposely built so that it ends right at that point. And they're set up so that you always have that, oh man, if only I had one more turn, if only I had two more turns. And that gives you a feeling like, okay, well, cool. I did this cool thing. I could imagine myself doing even more cool things. Let's play again. Right, even if you lost the game, and so I think those kinds of tools are really valuable outside of the explicit like things you maybe have to hack it so that people can actually actually win all the time. Uh, making you feel like you're winning, feel like you're making progress, is another really key part of good game design. Mm -hmm. Yep. And again, like there's so much like we can like get into. I'm like resisting the urge to just like we could spend the next two to three hours easily on this. I know that uh, we have about maybe like 15, 20 minutes, so. There before we kind of talk, there's one I guess like topic I want to discuss with you about kind of like where the tabletop market is now. Before we do that, anything else regarding a Soul Forge or any other project that you're working on from a design or just any kind of point of view that you would like to discuss? Yeah, I mean, there's a really interesting piece of the puzzle that's coming for me with Soul Forge Fusion. So we just released our third expansion um, mm -hmm. the last winter. Um, we have we just launched an in-app store so people can buy native digital objects, not just scan in their physical decks. Um, and we are soon going to be launching a Web3 element to the game, which I know mm -hmm. is a, something that a lot of people uh, in the classic gaming world look against, right? Having mm -hmm. a, a, a token and having the ability to trade your decks on an open market digitally um, mm -hmm. using NFTs. And so it's something that all of our, you know, we're not, uh, it's something I got excited about after doing a lot of research as a tool that allows people to build systems that um, 
go beyond the game itself, right? So people can mm-hmm. actually have uh, control of their own objects, just like I do when I, I have my physical magic collection, right? I can trade those, I can sell them, I can do what I want with them. You can't do that in even in magic online now, in the magic arena, mm-hmm. they don't let you transfer cards out of your account, right? Most most games nowadays do not let you do that. And I think that there's something really exciting about the types of systems that we can design as players get more control, not just of their game objects, but over the game in general, like the vast majority of what we're doing is going to be player controlled. Players will be able to decide how tokens get divided out for tournament rewards, for people that grow Mm -hmm. the community and stream for organizers, for different types of things that are built. And so I think it's been really interesting to me where the games are going to go as you, because there's been plenty of terrible examples. There's been scams. There's been games that are poorly mm-hmm. built. There's been games that are toppled on top of the pyramid scheme at the top. So there's been the, the everybody justifiably got like turned off to that space. But I'm actually very excited around it. And so we're going to be rewarding every single player of Soulport Fusion with free currency, free of these tokens, free of the ability to like mint their decks and be able to trade them and sell them. And I'm really interested to see how that evolves. Um, and our community evolves over time as we give people that extra power and agency, which again is normal in a tabletop world, right? I'm, I, I take it for granted that of course, anybody can run a tournament at the local shop or run a even nationwide or global tournaments and anybody can sell and trade and buy and do whatever they want with their cards. That's like the default mode for trading card games and tabletop. But for some reason it's become impossible in the digital world or unbelievably rare. Uh, and so I'm excited about what that means for how the communities will open up and how things will evolve. So that's probably mm-hmm. the last thing that's like a new arena we're just kind of moving into in the next couple of months that I'm, I'm excited about. Yep. And uh, one of my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Ramin, who also like he does a lot of like game. He's a game economist. He's been selling this for years. He, we had a whole discussion about uh, using using NFTs and that kind of uh, play to earn model for one of his projects. And it is, a, as I'm sure you're well aware of, it is a very polarizing topic right now. And it is one of those things that. And as a very fun point, I wrote about that in my book on free to play design. I said, like, this was like two years ago. I said, this set will either be the most dated or the most relevant by the time this book has come out. And it has gone in like a very like weird position. Like a lot of studios have been either pulling out of it. But again, like the whole argument over AI being used has mm-hmm. led to a lot more about this. And it is very tough. Like from like as you were describing it for Soul Forge and when Ramin was describing for his game, like that to me is kind of like where I see like somewhat of a positive for this, like being able to give someone direct ownership over a digital item. But the problem, and again, like we certainly don't have the time to get into that, get into this here, is trying to convince people that your game is ethical. Because as you're well aware of, I'm sure as this audience watching this is well aware of, there are a lot of like below the board, uh, very not so much illegal games that have used NFTs or have tried to promote this as the next big thing. That's, and it's very yeah, that's important. right. I think it's very important. It's very important. Sorry, yeah, I didn't mm-hmm. mean to interrupt you. It's very important to have that, uh, you know, I mm-hmm. that uh, trust and transparency, right? You know, mm-hmm. and so there's two two pieces to this that what we're doing about this, right? One mm-hmm. is look, obviously, I'm I'm out there personally in front of this right i've been doing this for 20 years i've been in the mm-hmm. game industry for 25 years i'm not here to like you know quick money grab and run right so the, the the team and that means i'm you know i'm in the discord i'm answering questions i'm communicating to people publicly about it because they they have justifiably different questions and the other thing that we've done which i think is also critical to help with the onboarding and help people feel comfortable is we have made the entire thing 100 opt-in so you can play the game mm-hmm without ever touching any of the web three elements, just like you can play the game tabletop and never scan it into the digital game. You can play the digital game and never buy the tabletop version. Everything is kind of a standalone pillar where you can pick the experience you want. If you want to be a part of that web three world and have that full Mm -hmm. ownership and have that ability to trade things, you can, if you don't great, just play a great game, right? The heart of this Mm -hmm. has got to be, it's got to be a great game and a great community. And then after Mm -hmm. that, the rest of it, you know, will build on top of that. So I think those things are all critical. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's actually a really good segue into this next question. This one may actually take us to the end, depending on how much we get into. But one thing that I want to ask you about, like when I was writing my book on like kind of the CCG, TCG mark and kind of like looking at like the major history of it, when we kind of talk about like the big names, people will gravitate towards uh, Pokemon, Magic the Gathering. And there was one other big one that I'm forgetting and all the CCG fans are going to come after me. And 
one of the things I was like trying to like look at was like how the market has changed. And again, as you're well aware of, as everyone watching is well aware of, how we buy and consume games have changed, and so is how it's been to make and produce these. And the tabletop market is no exception. I'm sure you're well aware of, of course, of how we had this huge Kickstarter boom when it came to the tabletop market. There are tabletop games that have earned. 900% more than what they're asking for. There are some massive names that have grown out of it. And from your own perspective, not only, you know, starting right back when Magic Gathering first began to where you're at now, how has, like, the tabletop market, like, changed, like, from, like, an insider's point of view? Oh, yeah, this could definitely take us to the end and beyond, mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs> so uh, a lot of things have changed, right? Um, you mentioned crowdfunding, right? Crowdfunding is, has been a massive shift over the last decade. Um, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Ascension is having its own crowdfund that's going to be launching in July. Uh, we're actually doing moving to GameFound for the first time. So the new set's called Ascension Legends. If you follow the campaign, you get free promo cards when it launches and you back it. Um, but it's a great way for us to access our users directly. And I, I absolutely love it because it changes. Whereas before, right, when I launched the first version of Ascension, I had to go to the, I had to go to trade shows. I had to get me, I had to build relationships with distributors and with stores, and then they would promote, the distributors would talk, would promote it to the stores. The stores would promote it to their fan, to the players, and they would discover the games that way. It doesn't work like that anymore. Now <laughs> the publishers have to promote directly to the fans bring enough enthusiasm and excitement through your connection to the fans that the stores, they, they demand the product from the stores and the stores ask for it from distributors and the distributors ask for it from you. So it's the exact opposite of what it used to be like. And so, um, you know, it's easier than it's ever been to make games, right? There's print on demand services. There's things like the game crafters and drive through cards. And there's tons, you know, the digital printing that we, the technology we use to make soul forge and mass scale lets you make games in small scale too. And there's so much that makes it easy to make a game that's ever been before. Plus more knowledge like podcasts like this one and books and courses and everything, right? None of this stuff was around when I was learning how to do this. But the flip side of that problem is that now there's a flood of games, right? There's just hundreds of thousands of games that get released every year between digital and physical. And there's just discovery and getting people to pay attention to your game and have a good reason to pay attention to your game and have a game that's going to last more than the two or three months that you maybe get a little bit of noise, but that's going to last over time uh that is a very big challenge and so there's a lot of different ways that things have changed in terms of consumer patterns in terms of what quality level of game you have to be able to produce in terms of what you have to do to be able to be worthy and justifying of their attention of what kind of live operations and content release schedules that you need to do to keep people's attention and to keep a game going um all of those things have changed dramatically over the last decade uh, on the bright side the industry is bigger than it's ever been too right there's more both video games and tabletop games are you know have been growing year over year consistently there was a massive growth during covid and a brief dip after to correct for that fact but other than that it's been a pretty steady growth the whole way through um and so it is a um it's a great time to be in the business but it's also a very challenging time to be in the business because uh getting your voice heard getting your game getting people to pay attention to your game uh, is harder than it's ever been yep and for kind of like the uh, tabletop market in of itself, like, I think another aspect that we've seen, at least from what I've been seeing, kind of like from the outside uh, perspective, or like the last five to seven years, has been kind of a greater push for the collection side or the chase of these cards. I know Magic got in some trouble for kind of like really trying to push, okay, we're going to release this a super exclusive booster box for hundreds of dollars. And a lot of people were just completely priced out for it. Like the collectors just immediately uh, vacuumed up the entire thing. And there is obviously big money in this, as you're well aware of, as everyone watching is well aware of. And like from like your own perspective, how has it been, again, like trying to, again, like bounce or, you know, uh, thread that needle between trying to earn a living with this but still making something that can be enjoyed by someone who maybe doesn't have a few extra hundred dollars or maybe again just wants to play your game for free and they don't want to have to worry about all this other stuff on top of it. Yeah, so I mean, this is a variant of the question we discussed earlier, right? I think like I, my my recipe is always the same. Like if I were a player of this game, would I be thrilled with the value that I'm getting mm -hmm. when I purchase it or when I play it? And if the answer is yes, 
then it's totally reasonable to charge money for such an experience, right? And the answer is no. And then I'm making purchases that are just there to like extract value out of my audience instead of grant the value, mm -hmm. then there's a problem, right? That's really like at a, at a, you know, kind of ethical, like core cornerstone where are we at, but you know, I want to build a game that intrinsically is going to be attractive, right? Like, so I, again, this mm -hmm. is what the, the starter for soul Force fusion, you get four decks. That's enough for two people to play 30, 34.99, I think it is, whatever we're charging for it now, or even less, obviously, the digital version. You could just have that and have a infinite variety of fun without ever buying another box ever. If you buy one other box, now the number of permutations, you've got like dozens of permutations of the ways you could shuffle the decks together. You never have to buy anything ever. You could just play that game. And we have a lot of players that that's what they do. When we release a new set, they buy like a booster or two, and then they got, and they're good. And that's fine. I'm totally happy to support that kind of player. And I want there to be something for the player who's like, man, I really want to get my dream deck. I want to try everything. I want to buy all the stuff. Awesome. Fantastic. So I think you want to create a game that, you know, as we talked about, you know, brackets for development, you want to have brackets for your purchasing patterns as well, right? What is the experience for the free-to-play player here? What is the experience for the player who's like, you know, a minnow, somebody who's buying a little bit? So what's it for a whale who's buying a ton, right? How, what is it like when those people play against each other? You want to be thinking through all of those patterns and make sure that each of those interactions and each of those tiers is healthy and fun and supportive overall, right? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't make, I don't apologize for making games that are designed to make money because otherwise, well, I don't get to make games. I got to go do something else. I got to go back to being a lawyer or whatever, right? <laughs> but I want to make sure that I'm, the value I'm providing is disproportionate to the amount uh, that 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 people have to pay and so yeah we're gonna you know the goal over time is to make soul forge right now it's in early access on steam so there's still a pay to download but the goal is over time that it becomes a free to play game that you can just enjoy as much as you want like all i want is for more people to enjoy my games if i can make enough money that i get to keep making them and people can enjoy them then fantastic we're doing it we're you know we're mission accomplished um and so i think it's just um you know when you talk about the different rarities and chase and how you drive people to those purchases it's going to vary by game. It's going to vary by audience, right? I designed a game in partnership with another company, um, uh, Japan anime games called Oshi Push. They just did a Kickstarter recently. And it's based off these um, VTuber characters, which I didn't even know they existed before working on this game. They're like like streamers, like 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 influencers, but they're all like anime characters. They're like like a, <laughs> someone's in a motion capture suit and they just have an anime character that does the things. Mm -hmm. It's massive, millions of people, whatever. And so that game you want to be chasing after these cool characters or the unique signed cards or the rare versions that are out there of your favorite characters. And so that game has lots of rarity tiers and lots of super chasers and lots of stuff to go after. Whereas a game like Soulforge Fusion, because every deck is unique, there's the, the, uh, the discovery process is built in. And so the no card is that rare. Like there's not that many like super, super rare individual cards. I think legendaries are top rarity tier and it's not even that rare, but because of the, the uniqueness comes in other ways, you're excited to have this discovery differently. So the, the the game category changes the type of rarity, the type of chase. What it is? What are the types of player profiles you're appealing to? What are the tools that are available to you? What are the tools that are mm -hmm. you know? You again, you're you're some players they're excited. The main part of the game. So I used to teach um, a Pokemon camp summer camp when i was younger you know back and and i would teach these kids and most of the kids did not know how to play the game at all they didn't care about playing the game at all they wanted mm -hmm. to open up a foil charizard they wanted to have that open cool moment and they <laughs> where they get the cool thing and they get to, they get to show it off to their friends and they have it in their note their little you know uh display book and everything that was the game for them and you would have done them a disservice if you took those super rare shiny cards away and so i think that you just need to understand what it is your audience is looking for and make sure that you're upfront about what you're delivering to them and that you're delivering what they're looking for. And then I think you have a lot of room to play and you can do a lot of different things that can appeal to those different types of players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the talking about kind of like the physicality, one other question, this may be its own little tangent. I just, I'm just curious, has, has there been any like major trends or changes in terms of, I guess, like the actual printing and manufacturing of like cards and tabletop figures. Cause again, like for like someone like me, who's been from the outside, I just think about, you know, something like a Warhammer or magic, but like as an insider from your own inside perspective, has there been any like major changes or shifts in that respect with regards to, I guess like the making like the physical quality of like a card or figurine, whatever. Yeah, of course. So like, I mean, again, Soul Fortune, Fusion, not to not mm -hmm. to be a dead horse, but we built digital printed cards that can all be shuffled mm -hmm. together and scanned into an online account 
did not mm. exist 10 years ago, could not have existed 10 years ago. Now, digital printing lets us do smaller print runs, lets us do more unique things like every single box, every single deck being different and one of a kind. Um, even the mass market game I was talking about earlier, you got to be kidding me. We actually let you print your own pets onto the cards. So you could have your own custom thing game with your pets on it out of the box. Like that's cool new technology. The ability to do cool miniatures. So we did a, a miniatures version of Ascension called Ascension Tactics, where you actually have a deck building game, but instead of attacking monsters in a row, you're using power to command your miniatures, your champions to move them around the board. That the quality level that we're able to do with the miniatures, and I did the World of Warcraft miniatures game back in 2008, uh, is so much different now than it used to be. The printing processes are so much more efficient. You can also do digital print on demand for that as well, right? People can get their custom figures for their Dungeons and Dragons games. Um, mm -hmm. Another cool thing we're doing with um, the new upcoming, I don't even know if I've talked about this yet, kind of a bit of a spoiler, but whatever, it's coming out soon. So the Ascension mm -hmm. Legends Kickstarter, uh, the crowdfund campaign on Gamebound, we're doing a, the legendary cards are all uh, lenticular art. So there's like three dimensional lenticular that when you transform, you turn it, the card, you know, basically has motion and changes. And it's really, really cool tech that again, that stuff has existed in the past, but I think um, A, there's a lot, it's better, way better now than it was uh, back in the day. And B, part of tying back into my previous point about discovery being a major problem, mm -hmm. when it comes to tabletop games, if you walk by a table and you see my game, I want you to stop and go, wait a minute, what is that? <laughs> Like that, that's awesome. How do I get that, right? And you're not going to do that with a regular set of cards, right? And so you can do it with beautiful art, you, but also like components that stand out like a cool lenticular card, like that's in the new Ascension set or a badass giant dragon like we did in Ascension Tactics or various other cool components that are really going to drive people into the experience, uh, I think matter a lot. And so there's the, you know, the possibilities of what you can do, again, better than it's ever been, being able to find something that hasn't been done before and that's going to draw people's attention in harder than it's ever been. Yeah. And yeah, again, like that is certainly facing the game industry as well with how easy it is to get in, but it's a lot harder to get that game in front of someone. And I guess uh, as another uh, question for you, are there any other like tabletop, doesn't have to be a CCG, could be a, a, a figurine or whatever. Are there any other games that's like kind of exciting or interesting that you like to give a shout out to? Um, you know, there's a lot of them. I think I'm looking over at my shelf here. I think <laughs> that there's like a, a few that have been exciting to me recently. Um, I think that I, you know, speaking to like kind of beautiful games, um, there's a game called Bonsai. That's a board game that I really like um, where it has basically you're building out a bonsai tree uh, and it's sort of a tableau building game, but it doesn't feel like it because it's just such a beautiful experience. And you either meditate where you grab a card and grab resources or you cultivate where you take your resources and you add them and you grow your tree. You get different points based on the rules of how the, you know, flowers and leaves and fruits and everything build off the tree. So it's just like a nice way to boil down this essentially a center row drafting type of game, which is what Ascension was one of the innovators on. Uh, but it's in, done in a way that I think could appeal to mass audiences and like be very accessible. Like I really, I mean, I'm intrigued by this space where you take, the things that the mechanics that we know and love and bring them into a new, if not a totally new genre to a new audiences or widen the sphere with which they can reach. Um, mm -hmm. There's another game I've been playing a lot lately called Radlands, which is a, it feels like a, a TCG experience, but it's inside of one box. It's not, not expandable, not collectible, um, but it's got this like 1v1 TCG like vibe to it, but you're playing off a common deck and you don't have to worry about, you know, rebalancing cards or collecting cards or anything like that. So that's kind of fun for me. Um, I guess in terms of tabletop, those were the two that I probably played the most recently that aren't my games. There's a reality that, uh, you know, as you design games for a living, you have a lot less time to play mm -hmm. games that are not, you know, just for fun. So I'll, very often I will play a game once just so I understand it, if it's like new and hot or whatever, but uh, it's rare that I'll be able to like come back to games that I'm not working on just kind of for fun to play. But those two I've played a good amount recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that feeling with all the games I've been neglecting with writing and making videos and doing stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, it's a, it's one of those things. It's a, the, the blessing and a curse that we get to do what we love uh, for a living. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does mean that sometimes it's a little bit more of the work side of it than just the play side of it. Oh, yes. All right. I know we are uh, coming up on time here. So any uh, final thoughts, any final points you'd like to discuss before we kind of like do our end of cast wrap up? Yeah, you know, I think for 
people listening to this, there's probably a lot of people that are, you know, either game designers or aspiring designers. And I just want to kind of put out there that like, I appreciation for you, first of all, for putting out all the material and lessons that you do. I put out a lot of free stuff on the Think Like Game Designer Substack, but I think outside of the listening and reading and learning about games, the most important thing is to actually put yourself out there, right? You have mm -hmm. to prototype and test your ideas and they're usually pretty bad. The same is true for me. My, my early prototypes are bad. And you have to be willing to take in that feedback, not let it attack your ego, and then be willing to take in that feedback and refine mm -hmm. and make the game better. And even more importantly, make yourself better as a designer. And that uh, if you're, for those that are out there, I just encourage everybody like take that leap, make their, make a commitment, schedule a play test, come find us at Gen Con, my, myself and my whole team will be at Gen Con. If you want to show me a prototype, I'm happy to take a look at it. I'm actually going to be doing a live lecture and talk of things about games under there too. But I, I've reached the phase of my career where, of course, I'm passionate about my own projects and happy to talk with them, but I'm also very passionate about empowering others. Um, so if there's anybody out there that's, uh, you know, is looking for that extra little kick in the butt to get going, uh, this is officially it. There's no way to get good at game design without actually doing game design uh, and showing your stuff to people and uh, and getting that feedback. So I just encourage everybody to do that. All right. Sounds good. So uh, to wrap things up uh, for our cast for tonight, Justin. So I guess first thing, uh, for people listening to us, so uh, Soul Forge uh, Reforge is in early access right now. Uh, do you have like, any estimated dates or an idea of when it will be released at 1.0? So Soul Forge Fusion, it's oh, hard Fusion, to assess. Look, we've had the physical version out since um, you know October of 2022. So the physical game has been out for a while. There's no such thing as early access. It's the game, right? You can play it. Mm -hmm. uh, the game is good. And the digital game, the early access digital game is also good in there. And we're going to continue to add features to it. I, I hate to submit a specific date. Um, we are planning to have that Web3 element uh, very soon, like within the next 60 days. And so anybody, I encourage people to jump in and play the game. There's a free demo version you can play as well if you don't want to you know, tra take, take my word for it. Um, but you can play the game. Everybody that plays the game, everybody will get some free currencies and some free goodies. So it's a perfect time to try it out in terms of when we like make the official transition from early access to uh, to full release. Uh, we won't make a commitment, but there's a lot of awesome new features coming. Uh, we do releases and updates every two weeks. So there's lots of cool stuff. So it's a great time to kind of get involved. And if you join our Discord, which you can find from stoneblade.com or selfwatchfusion.com, um, myself and my team are there and active. We've got a very active community and the community does really help influence the decisions we make. So it's a great time, again, for those that are interested in the game design process um, that want to get involved and have conversations with myself and my team uh it's a perfect time to be getting engaged all right sounds good and any other projects you're working on any other teasers you like to throw to people uh, watching us yeah so i've already mentioned the crowdfund for um the ascension legends which is coming in late july um at gen con i mentioned i'll be there we will have um an early version of our shards of infinity saga edition which we did a crowdfund for last year um that'll be actually releasing in the fall uh, I mentioned You Gotta Be Kidding Me is in targets nationwide. Um, that's really fun, light game, two to 10 players. You can play with your family for 4th of July weekend, like the non-gamers in the group. Um, that one's a really uh, valuable thing. And then uh, in terms of other fun things to tease, oh, I'll be doing another version of my Think Like a Game Designer Masterclass um, in probably September. So that's a very limited exclusive access thing. We do 12 weeks personal attention for me and my team. We take your project from zero to pitch to publishers at the end of those 12 weeks. It's the best way I know uh, how to go from, you know, I, I think I'm a game designer. I want to be a game designer to like, no, 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 we're really doing the process and going. It's super fun. We only do it once a year because it's very time intensive uh, for me and my team, but it's something I'm very excited about. So far, we've always found somebody from that. We've hired somebody from every class as part of my team. So it's uh, there's no guarantees, but we definitely get some really great, talented people. And it's an incredible community. Um, so that's something people can just uh, follow along. We'll have more news about that next month. All right. Sounds good. And other than that, I guess, uh, anything you'd like to say to the fans uh, watching to take us out for tonight? Yeah, I mean, you know, I kind of gave uh, gave my my initial uh, push earlier, right? I, I do encourage people to live fulfilling creative lives. If you're passionate about games, find a way to get involved and contribute, whether that's a game designer, whether that's getting involved in online forums, whether that's doing things like you know, podcasts and videos and reviews and communities. Like, there's nothing I found more fulfilling than taking that leap. Uh, and so I just encourage other people to do that. If you want to join our communities, again, the Discord, um, stoneblade.com, you can sign up or think like gamesigner.com. You can find my uh, my blog and all that stuff. But but wherever it is, you know, find a community of people who share your passions, 
uh, and and put in the hard work to you know go and, and and live your dreams out there. It's something that I was scared to as death to do, scared to death to do myself, uh, but it was the best decision I made. So if my example can help inspire anyone, then I'm going to call that a big win. All right, fantastic. So uh, with that, I think we'll wrap up our conversation for tonight. Justin, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you this uh, evening. And yeah, if you are free in the future, there's still so much more to talk about in terms of tabletop and game design that we can probably fit a few more uh, conversations in for sure. I would love that very much. All right. So in terms of social media, you mentioned, of course, your website, Stone Blade Entertainment. Anything else you want to mention in terms of social media, place people can find you, projects, whatever? Yeah, I mean, look, you can, uh, if you just Google my name, you will find me on all the different social platforms. Um, I have the, my Substack is probably the best place to do it. So it's just justingarydesign.substack.com or just justingarydesign.com will take you there. That has where I generally, I'll post articles, I'll post my podcast, I'll post everything that's happening. Um, so that's a great way to follow. Uh, but but in general, if you're on the Stoneblade email list, if you're on that Substack or if you're in our Discord, those are the three best places to connect with me. But I'm on every social platform. So you can find me and message me anywhere and you'll, uh, uh, generally speaking, I'll get to you after a little bit and respond. So always happy to have uh, people engage. All right. Fantastic. So uh, for everyone watching, we're going to end our conversation here. From my side, again, do the YouTube install, check out the Discord, buy all the copies of the books that you see fit. And as I said at the start, if you are a developer working on an upcoming game or just want to come chat game dead with me, I'm always looking for a guest. So again, Justin, thank you for coming on and best of luck with uh, Soul Forge and your upcoming uh, crowdfunding and anything else you have in mind. Thank you. All right. So that's it, everyone. Come back for daily discussions on uh, game design here and on game wisdom, where some of the art and science of games. Until our next conversation, take care.